So, so my name is Michael Buster, and I'm a driver engineer from Imagination Technologies. And I'm here today to talk to you about how using specifically command letters and pipelines, but indeed all of them, allows applications to provide more information up front, so to allow implementations to not have to rely so much on the guesswork or heuristics like they would have to in perhaps a more traditional API. And this is really important, because while heuristics gets you most of the way there, uh, and it covers the vast majority of use cases, there's always going to be some applications that fall foul of the driver's guesswork and end up on the dreaded slow path. So by using Vulkan, you can get a lot more predictability. But obviously, you can also get a lot more performance, as Tom's alluded to. Uh, and in my presentation, I'm not going to be talking so much about GPU performance. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on the CPU, which is what command buffers and pipelines are designed for. So we're both going to look at single threaded efficiency, as well as how command buffers and, to a lesser extent, pipelines allow applications to exploit multiple threads when they're writing their applications, uh, which, <coughs> as you know, is critical in the modern CPU landscape. Uh, it's not just about performance, and it's not just about predictability. It's about battery life as well. If you can maintain the same performance in a Vulkan application that you have in your OpenGLS application, but do so at a significantly lower CPU cost, you're going to be more friendly on your battery, and that's pretty important because you don't want people burning holes in their pockets. <coughs> so this thing doesn't work. I don't know what it is. Click the right button. Was working. Uh, it wasn't focused. There we go. Oh, that's not too so what are command buffers? Command buffers are a deferred list of commands that you are going to submit to the GPU for later execution. And that's the key difference between Vulkan command buffers and the types of commands you would send in OpenGL. In OpenGL, if you ignore display lists because they're pretty grim, everything's immediate. There's no difference between recording a command and submitting a command for execution. They're intrinsically entwined. And from a driver's point of view, this is really painful because all the driver sees when it's implementing an OpenGL uh, or an OpenGLES driver is the application saying, do a draw call, do a draw call, do a draw call. And how many more draw calls are going to come? The driver has no idea. It can't predict the future. Uh, what types of draw calls are going to come? What are those draw calls used for? The driver has absolutely no idea. So this is a really big problem. And I'll give a very, very oversimplistic example of the types of issues you can run into when trying to implement a more traditional API. So we know we're going to be accepting commands from the application, and we need to ship those commands off to our GPU for execution. Now, we don't want to just take each individual command and submit that, that to the GPU, because there's an inherent overhead, both on the CPU and the GPU, to submitting commands to the engine for execution. So we're going to have to buffer up some commands. We're going to have to batch them. So internally, we're going to implement a command buffer. And how big are we going to make our command? Well, let's make an arbitrary decision and say our command buffer can pass space for 50 commands. Now, the first application that we're going to run comes along and gives us five commands. So we'll record those five commands into our command buffer, but we don't want to submit our command buffer for execution yet because we know that there's inefficiency if we submit empty or under full command buffers. The problem is if that application doesn't send any more commands, when does that work get scheduled for execution? Well, who knows? It's most likely going to get submitted to the GPU due to that command buffer being flushed by some, at least according to the application, unrelated command that it records. Uh, and this is pretty bad, because you get unpredictability, and it might not be the worst for performance, but uh, it, you'll see hitching and lag, and the application starts to mistrust the driver. On the other hand, the second application comes along, and now it sends 50,000 commands to the driver. Well, we only have space for 50, so what we're going to do is we're going to fill up our command buffer, submit it to the GPU, and then repeat a thousand times. And this is also bad, because like we said, there is a slight overhead both on the CPU and the GPU to submitting command buffers. And yes, there are many ways in which drivers can go to solve these issues. And the problem is these are all clever ways and they're heuristics. They work most of the time, but they don't work all the time. Vulcan solves this by separating the, fa separate, separating the act of recording commands from the act of executing those commands. So now when an application says, record this command, the driver doesn't have to worry how many more commands are going to come. The application is going to tell the driver when it's finished recording commands. So the driver can concentrate on, concentrate on just creating the most efficient command buffer for that set of commands. And there's a whole bunch of other benefits to this separation that we'll see as we go through. So Tom mentioned descriptive calls. There's also an equivalent command call. Now, I said before that we've removed all the guesswork from Vulkan, 
that's a little bit of a lie. While the driver is recording the command buffer, it still doesn't know how big that command buffer is going to be. And there is some overhead in the bookkeeping to do with calculating how much resources the command buffer is owed. So instead we use the command buffer pool, and what the command buffer pool does is allow an implementation to amortize the cost of allocations in a command buffer over multiple command buffers. So rather than storing all this bookkeeping and overhead information per command buffer, we can instead store it on a command pool and share the load. Command pools also allow the synchronization. So again, there's slight overhead to bookkeeping the threading model. And instead of putting that burden on every single command buffer, you're going to have far more command buffers than you're going to have command pools, because you can have far more command buffers than you have threads. So by putting this on the pool, we just reduce the cost of having to repeat everything on different command buffers. Now, pools are also interesting in that they own all the resources for all command buffers that have been allocated from that pool. What this means is you can reset a pool and instantly reclaim all of the resources that have been allocated for all of those command buffers. And there are certain types of applications that might batch all their command buffers for a single frame into a single pool. And once that frame is finished, they want to free up all the resources for all of those command buffers. Now, rather than going through one by one the hundreds of command buffers, they can instead go to the pool and reclaim all their resources. If you do want to be able to reset individual command buffers, you have to opt into that behavior when you create a command buffer. And this is a common theme throughout the whole You opt into behavior if it's more restrictive, if and only if you need it. If you don't need to individually reset command buffers, don't set the flag that allows you to. If you don't set the flag, the driver can do a much better job if it knows it's only ever going to be dealing with group reset rather than individual reset. Now, like I said, command pools provide very lightweight threading context. So what is the problem with open job? Well, the way drawing works, and I've said single thread open GL context here. Yes, like Tom alluded to, there are shared contexts in open GL which do allow a limited form of multi-threading, but there are still pretty big limitations on shared context. You can't have multiple threads concurrently recording commands which are drawing to the same FBO. Uh, and also there's a huge amount of driver overhead in making the magic of shared contexts just work. So they're not a real answer. The way OpenGL works is inside the driver there's a ledger or a book. And whenever you bind a bit of state or change a texture or do pretty much any state operation, what you're doing is you're updating that ledger to record the latest bit of state. When you come to record a draw call or in OpenGL submit a draw call, what the driver does is it looks at that ledger and it says, well, I need all of these bits of state, so I'm going to take it from here and then bake that into my draw call. Now, the problem is, since we only have one ledger for the entire context, you obviously can't have multiple threads which are all updating or reading from that ledger at the same time because they would trample on each other. In Vulkan, that state update, that state information, is held on each individual command buffer. What this means is, if thread one is recording to the first command buffer, it can mutate its own set of state. Then thread two can record to a different command buffer and update a different bit of state. And this allows us to have as many threads as we want recording to as many command buffers as we want. So I put thread n here, but really you're probably going to want to limit that either at start up statically or with a max thread count. And it's most likely you're going to want about as many threads as you have CPU cores, unless you want to reserve some for other behavior. Now, before we said the limitation of pools is that you can't have multiple threads concurrently recording to the same command pool. What this means is, if thread one and thread two's command buffers came from the same command pool, the application would have to synchronize between those threads, which is not what we want. So instead, you have n threads. What you'll almost always want to do is create n command pools. Each thread gets assigned a command pool, and then will only work with command buffers which belong to that thread's command pool. And it sounds more onerous, but it's actually really easy to work with, and it works really well. So now that we know why we want command buffers, the benefits of command buffers, and the fact that we can go in parallel, which is great, what do we actually put into these command buffers? Well, we've got different commands in them. Um, that's not the slide I should have got. There we go. We've got different commands into the command buffers. Uh, so I've missed out one type of command, which is state setting. Now, state setting isn't really a command that gets necessarily executed on the GPU. It's more of a command that just updates this ledger I was talking about inside the command buffer. So uh, I've skipped off this slide because it's not really a GPU command. So we've got synchronization, and I don't want to go into that because that's the subject of the talk, which the bias is going to be walking us through. We have compute commands, which are currently dispatch, dispatch, and direct, 
uh, exactly what you expect. Graphics commands, which are a little bit special due to render passes, uh, and graphics commands are things like your draw commands, your subclass management commands, uh, as well as clearing attachments and a few other different commands like the uh, occlusion queries and whatnot. Finally, there's transfer commands. Um, transfer commands are probably a little bit more interesting for this talk because if you come from an OpenGL or an OpenGLES background, a lot of the work that transfer operations do are hidden from you quite significantly. So, what are transfer commands? Now, I've lied on this slide, there's a typo. Uh, transfer commands are almost always raw copies of art when they're not. Uh, and the exception to this rule is glyph image, which does allow you to scale an image. Uh, but largely speaking, transfer commands are commands that copy memory from one place to another. Uh, the special thing about transfer commands is they can change the tiling of an image. Now, I don't have time to go into exactly what image tiling is, but I'll give a very brief overview. In Vulkan, there are two types of images. There are optimally tiled images and linear linearly tiled images. You almost never want to use a linearly tiled image. The use cases are quite niche. If you know what you're doing and you really need to use one, great. For the most part, only ever use optimally tiled images. In fact, on many implementations, there are really severe limitations on linear images. So in Power VR, for example, you can't have mitmaps on a linear image. You can't have image arrays. Uh, I don't think you can do 3D. Uh, only ever use optimal images. You don't want to use anything else. So, the first type of transfer, which is probably the most important, is transferring data from the CPU to the GPU. Now, this isn't necessarily from your CPU memory to your GPU memory, but this is from CPU visible memory into GPU only memory. The reason you might want to do this is if you've got a Titan Fury X or whatever they're called sitting in the PC at home, you can have some static data in your scene. So let's say static mesh data. You're going to write it once from the CPU when you load your application, and you're never going to change it again. The CPU will never touch that data. Which means you want this data to be in a memory which is as fast as possible for the GPU to consume. You don't care about the CPU's access to that memory. Unfortunately, on quite a few different types of discrete cards, the fastest GPU memory might not necessarily be visible to the CPU. So how do you get your static data into that really fast memory? Well, you create a staging buffer in CPU visible memory. You write your buffer data into it. You then allocate your buffer in GPU visible memory, in that really fast bit of memory. And then you create a transfer command, which transfers from the slow CPU only access once memory into that really fast access multiple times memory. And this is the type of thing that those terrible, terrible usage hints in OpenGL try to invite to the driver, but let's not talk too much about them. Uh, this stuff is hidden from you in OpenGL, it's now the application's job to do. Now you might think, well, if I'm on a SOC or a UMA system, I can see all the memory that the GPU can see, so I don't care about these transfers. Well, that would be true if it wasn't for that aforementioned image tiling. The only way to write an optimally tiled image is to use the transfer command. This is because different implementations have a different view of what an optimally tiled image is. So while you might be able to physically access the memory, you don't know what the meaning of the bytes in that memory is. So what you have to do is, again, create a staging buffer, write your linearly tiled image into the staging buffer, then allocate the optimally tiled image, and transfer from the staging buffer to the optimally tiled image. Similarly, if you want to read back from either a buffer, which is in this special GPU-only memory, or you want to read back an image which is currently optimally tiled, you'll have to do the same thing in reverse. Again, create a staging buffer in CPU visible memory, and then queue a transfer that pulls it back from this GPU optimally tiled format back into the CPU in a linear format. <coughs> now, the final class of transfers is really interesting, because this is GPU to GPU transfers. Strictly speaking, all of these are GPU to GPU, but this is when the CPU is not involved at all. They're not generating any data, data on the CPU. It's all from the GPU and consumed by the GPU. Now, the first type of GPU to GPU transfer, which is interesting, would be pipeline updates of data. What this means is, if you have a command buffer referencing data in a UBO, like Tom mentioned, you're now responsible for synchronizing access to memory. And that includes CPU to GPU synchronization. So while the GPU is referencing data in a buffer, you can't run write that on the CPU. The driver's not going to stop you and you're going to get undefined results. What you can do is you can create a staging buffer that has the new data in it. You can upload your commands and then you can queue a transfer task which will happen after your first set of draw commands have finished consuming that data, which will update the data in the UPO. And then you can submit the same set of commands again, which are going to run, but with new data back 
So that's a pretty good way to do reuse command buffers and reuse them with a different set of data backing. Uh, the other really important use case is MIPGEN, where you would queue up a series of VK command blitz images to generate your MIP maps. There is no VK command to generate MIP maps. It's up to the application to do. So we said before, graphics commands are special. And why are they special? Well, they're special because they have to go inside a random class. And the opposite of that is true. A, a command which is a non-graphics command is not allowed inside a random class at all. Uh, and exactly what a random class is and why we have these limitations, Andrew's going to be covering. Uh, but for the moment, all you need to know is graphics commands have to go inside a random class. There's another limitation. Random classes have to be in one command buffer. You can't begin a random class in command buffer A and then end it in command buffer B. And um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is quite a severe limitation, because before we said the way you exploit multiple threads is by creating multiple command buffers and compiling them all the multiple threads. Now, the problem is, if you've got many graphics work, and in a lot of applications, you're going to, the bulk of your work will be draw commands to the same scene. How do we split this up over multiple threads? Well, we do have an answer, and that's called secondary command buffer. So a secondary command buffer is very similar to a primary command buffer. You create and interact with it in exactly the same way. You just pass a flag when you start it to indicate to the driver that it is in fact a secondary command buffer. Now the difference in usage with the secondary command buffers is you never execute a secondary command buffer on the GPU directly. You never submit it to the GPU. Instead what you do is you execute that secondary command buffer in the context of a primary command buffer. Think that it's a function call and you can just call that function over and over again. But there are two rules that govern secondary command buffers. The first rule is you can only put commands inside a secondary command buffer that would be legal to execute where you execute those secondary commands. So if you're going to execute commands inside a render class, your secondary command buffers are only allowed to contain graphics commands. If your secondary command buffers have non-graphics commands, they're only allowed to be executed outside of a render class. But what this does do is it allows us to get around the limitation from so we've got one single big scene that we want to record a whole bunch of draw calls to. We can split that scene up over a bunch of secondary command buffers on multiple threads, record them all concurrently, and then bring them back together and execute them inside the same second, inside the same random class. Now the second rule of secondaries is you'll notice that I'm doing the same state operations, these grey boxes on the bottom, in both sets of secondary command buffer. There is no state inheritance or state linkage from primary command buffers to secondary numbers, or from secondary to secondary, or secondary to primary. So you can't inherit any states other than the frame buffer attachments. So the only time you don't have to re-record a secondary command buffer is if you're recording the same set of draw commands, but to a different image of the same format. But other than that, you have to rebind all the states independently in each secondary command buffer. What this means is you probably want to achieve a balance between creating too many secondary command buffers, which gives you much finer grained control over dispatching work to multiple CPUs, uh, uh, but you don't want to make them too small that the overhead of doing the fine operations in each secondary command buffer counteracts the benefits of creating more fine grained control. The secondary command buffers, uh, primary command buffers to a lesser extent, also bring up a really cool technique in Vulkan which wouldn't really be possible in a traditional API. And that's command buffer reuse. So if you've seen the demo outside of GNOME board before, then this is exactly what I'm explaining. If you've not, it's in the demo room and you can look at something for sure. Effectively, what we do is we split up the scene. We split up the scene into a whole bunch of sections. I would say tiles, but tiles is not a nice word. Uh, and then we cross them check those tiles or sections against the camera. Any tile which is currently in view, we put onto a task queue, and then we have a whole bunch of threads which are going to pull tasks off that queue and record a secondary command buffer that contains the draw calls required to draw that, just that individual section of the scene. We then submit the primary command buffer, which has all the secondary command buffers within it, and it goes off and is drawn. Great, so we've used multiple threads. What would be better than that? Well, on the next frame along, we're going to move the camera. And unless you're interested in making your users or players sick, you're probably not going to move the camera that far, especially if you're going at 60 FPS or higher. So the camera's moved a little bit. What this means is the majority of the uh, tiles which are in blue here are actually exactly the same tiles that were in view last frame. The red tiles have gone out of view, so what we can do is we can reset these command buffers. And this is a, an example of a case where you would want to be able to individually reset command buffers rather than doing a group reset. Uh, 
so you can reset the red column buffers and reclaim their resources because we don't want to use more and more memory. The new column buffers in group, the new column buffers which we require are in green, correspond to these green tiles. So you can put the green tiles onto our task queue, press all those tasks off, create secondary command buffers, and we can re execute them. But all of those tiles in blue, which is the majority of the tiles, they're the same as last frame. Yeah, we update the UVO so that they're in a different position, the camera's changed, but largely speaking, they're the same. So while we go back and re record, we already have them from the previous frame. And indeed, we can do that in Vulkan. We can take a command that we've recorded previously and re execute it as many times as we want, as many times as it's available. Now, there is a spectrum of applications where, on one side, like GNOME board, it's really easy to take advantage of this. We take advantage of it for basically every drawable in the scene. There are going to be some applications on the far end of the spectrum where they're not going to be, they're not going to be able to take advantage of this at all. Uh, it's simply not possible. But most applications are going to fall somewhere in the middle. So, for example, if you've got a bunch of static geometry and some dynamic geometry, you might want to think about partitioning the scene by static geometry, recording command buffers for that static geometry, and then special case in the dynamic geometry and recording that every frame. So, to a greater or lesser degree, different applications can take really good advantage of command buffer reuse, and that's the number one way to get CPU efficiency. It's far better to do no work at all than it is to do a little bit of work really fast. So, if you can use command buffer reuse, and you can architect your application to take advantage of it, I strongly recommend you do it. Uh, finally, just a brief word on lifetimes. Tom's already mentioned most of this. When you allocate a command buffer, until the point in time you submit it, that command buffer belongs to the CPU, it belongs to the application. So you can do whatever you want with it. You can record it to it, you can reset it, you can free it. Uh, that's basically the only operations you can do with it. However, once you've submitted it to the GPU, it now belongs to the GPU. It's not yours anymore. Don't touch it. Undefined things will happen, and the API will not stop you from touching it, but if you do, something will almost definitely break. Now you can wait on that command buffer until it's completed on the GPU, and once it has, now it's in the CPU domain again, and you can do whatever you want with it. So, now that we know command buffers are great, they allow us to use multiple threads, they reduce the few costs, what have you actually put inside command buffers other than those uh, draw commands? Well, that state I was talking about before is really important. And pipelines are, at least in my opinion, the most important concept that Vulkan introduces for reducing frame hitching and unpredictability across implementations and even within an implementation. So what are pipelines? Pipelines are a whole bunch of stuff, an immutable bundle of stuff. And that's the difference between OpenGL and Vulkan. In OpenGL, you can GL enable this, GL enable that, GL blend func this, blah, blah, blah. You can tweak little knobs all at a very fine granularity. The problem with this is pipelines are built up of a whole bunch of things. And in OpenGL, we're building on a legacy where everything was a fixed function state. And then we slapped programmable shapers on. And then we slapped resources on top. And then we slapped more dynamic states on top of that. And it was all a bit of a, um, a, bit of a disaster. So, it's these fixed function states that are actually the cause of all of our problems. See, the dirty secret of a lot of modern implementations is many of these fixed function states, and this differs across implementations and it might differ within a vendor even. Many of these fixed function states are actually implemented as shader code, which we either append or prepend or interleave into the programmable shader stages that an application provides. Now, the problem with this is. The application doesn't, in OpenGL, you don't provide the fixed function states at the point in time you compile your program. You just provide the shader strings for all the stages and then link them together. What this means is, in an implementation, let's take Power VR for example, we do uh, color blending in shader code. So you create your program, but you've not given us the blend code. Well, what are we going to do? We can't fully compile the shader at that point in time. We can certainly do some work at shader create time, but not all the work. Instead, what's going to happen is we have to wait until we see the full set of states that contribute to the shader code before we can actually do that final step of compiling all the way down into the most optimal hardware code. And this manifests as hitching, and it's the worst thing in OpenGL and OpenGL US. You're, you've written your game, and your player is walking down a corridor, and your frame rate's great, 60 FPS, I'm loving it. They turn around the corner and pull out their torch, and now you want to activate your really fancy stencil shadow and shadow volume effects and blooms and whatnot because they've got their different 
their new lighting effects out. But from the driver's point of view, this is the first time it's ever seen this combination of shader plus all the fixed function state. And it's going to stall because it's going to have to go off and recompile some shaders because this is the first time it's ever seen these shaders being used in such a way. Now the player's annoyed because their frame rate's tanked. The developer's annoyed because of A on their system, it might have worked better, and they don't think they're doing anything wrong. I'm just changing some states. That's what the API is for. The API lets me do it, so I should be able to do it. And all the time, the driver is happening off compiling GLSL. And this is awful. So the reason you have pipelines is we take all of that state, all of that state that could possibly contribute to a pipeline recompile, and we bundle it up into one immutable object. What this means is the point in time that the application provider asks the driver to compile the pipeline, the driver has all that information, and that's the time it can actually compile the pipeline. So when you call VK create graphics pipelines, the driver is not going to not create your graphics pipelines at that point in time. It's going to do what you say, when you say it. And by doing so, you're going to remove a whole load of unpredictability from your application, not to mention horrible frame hitching. So what are these fixed function states? They're all the stuff from OpenGL. There's nothing new added. Uh, it's basically everything that isn't a descriptive layout or a shader. What about things that are shaders? Well, we've got some shader stages. Same as OpenGL. Uh, computers and on here, compute pipelines are slightly different from graphics pipelines. Uh, largely similar, but they only have a single shader stage. Uh, Bear in mind, test and geometry aren't in every single implementation. They're not required by the API, but they are in the core API. Uh, and the cool thing about shaders in Vulkan, as Neil's going to be talking a lot more about next, is they are in a binary intermediate format, which uh, I'm not a compiler person. I don't know anything about dominators or graphs. What I do know is there's a massive pain when you're implementing a driver and you're implementing a GLSL parser because we're going to implement it slightly differently from another implementation. Um, there's a whole load of variability. Uh, so, Sphere is great for removing that variability again between implementations. We have the descriptor layout, and I think Jesse's going to be talking a lot more about this, but I'll just give a terrible analogy instead. Uh, so, what's a descriptor layout? Well, if you consider a UPO in OpenGL, when we compile our shader, we don't have to pass a UPO that we're using exactly for that shader. Instead, in the shader code, we write a interface layout block which doesn't describe the contents of the UBO, but it describes the types of the contents of the UBO. Uh, Descriptor layout is almost identical. It doesn't contain the resources that the shader or the pipeline is going to use. It just describes the types of the resources that the pipeline is going to use. And the reason we require this when you compile the pipeline is so that the implementation can make sure that the pipeline it compiles is compatible with any descriptor set that has been created from the same descriptor layout. Uh, which is important for fast switching pipelines without having to rebind uh, resources or vice versa. And uh, finally, if I told you you had to recreate a pipeline for every time you change the stencil state, you would probably tell me, well, you'd ask me what I'm smoking, and then you wouldn't use the API because that would be quite frankly terrible. There are obviously really valid use cases for changing state draw by draw. Uh, classic example, you do stencil shadows, you want to change the stencil ref value every single draw call. You don't want to create a new pipeline for every single one of those. Uh, so there is some dynamic state involved in, but it's important to know it is opt-in. By default, it's static, but when you can create when you create your graphics pipeline, you can declare to the implementation that you want some states to be treated as dynamic. Uh, and the reason that you want to explicitly tell the application the implementation that states is dynamic is if it knows the state doesn't need to change draw to draw, which is much of the time it can create a significantly more efficient pipeline. So only create a dynamic state when you do actually need it to be dynamic. The final piece of the pipeline puzzle is the cache. Now, since we're going to be creating far more pipelines in Vulkan than we have shapes in OpenGL, the reason for this, we've baked a lot more state into, that, into the pipeline compared to a shader in OpenGL, so we're going to have an explosion of pipelines, which potentially could be bad for memory. So we have a pipeline cache object that aims to mitigate the pains of having too many pipelines. Uh, it's a really simple object from the application's point of view. Basically, you pass a handle into a compile, and the implementation will first, before compiling the new pipeline, check to see if there's any information in the cache that it can reuse for the current compile. If it does generate any new work from the compile, it will write that work back to the pipeline cache, so any subsequent compiles can leverage that work. Uh, the pipeline cache is also the mechanism by which Vulkan allows you to load and store shaders. Um, by the way, this works way better than an OpenGL with shader binaries, 
because we have more information when we create the pipeline, what we write out to disk is significantly closer to what we need when we load it back in again. Uh, so you can't load and store pipelines individually, you just load and store the cache. Uh, so I think I'm out of time, and I'm also out of slides, which is a pretty quick coincidence. So thank you very much for putting up with me. Um, I don't know if there are time for questions. One or two questions. Yeah, one, two questions. Yeah, one question. Uh, in the in term uh, of abstraction level, sorry, in the term of abstraction level, are uh, OpenGL and uh, Vulkan pretty much the same level, or Vulkan is at a slightly lower level? Uh, Vulkan is significantly lower level. There are Sign abstractions. Significantly lower. So things like the transfer commands in OpenGL, when you upload a texture, you just say upload a texture and the texture gets uploaded, and in Vulkan you have to store that yourself. For example, that's just one example amongst many. All yeah. lines have been unmuted. Anyone has a question on the? Just one question. Um, if you, if the ownership of the pipeline changes to the GPU when you submit it, can you, sorry, the ownership of the command buffer, can you reuse command buffers in subsequent calls or subsequent frames? Yes. Um, so remember, you can resubmit as many times as you want. There is a flag that you have to opt in to do this. Again, it's opt in, so if you don't need to do it, don't do it because the implementation to do something more efficient. There's something called simultaneous use. So if you set the simultaneous use on a command buffer, you can submit that command buffer while it's already in execution. You can't do anything else. You can't reset it or reuse it, but you can submit it multiple times. So and if you do need to use simultaneous use, then set the flag. If you don't, don't just set the flag if you don't. That's the story about the whole of Vulcan. There's a whole lot of opt-in features that make tailor the API to your use case. If you don't need that feature, don't set it because the implementation can do something faster. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, just on that, um, is, it, is it always slower to use the simultaneous use flag or just on some implementations? Uh, so the question that I don't think that came through, but uh, is it always slower to use simultaneous use? No. It'll, it'll vary across implementations. It will, it shouldn't really ever be faster to use simultaneous use. Well, I'm struggling to pick a situation where it could. Uh, but it might be slower on some implementations. Like that between tester. Test across every implementation you care about running on. You really have to do that. Cheers. Please put the mic. <laughs> Can you write uh, command buffer on the video? So currently, no. There's exploratory work. I'm sure that people are doing to enable things like that, but that's not the right end of the So you cannot do executing a direct If you, you cannot do something like the executing direct execution. You can't do executing direct. You can get close. You can create a command buffer. But... Uh, you can create a command buffer that exclusively contains draw and direct calls and then basically no out all those calls by setting their instance count to zero, which is not as efficient, but it gets you most of the way there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Shall we unmute? All lines have been unmuted. Any questions on the conference call bridge? So yeah, thank you very much for putting up with me. I hope all of you at least took one tasty morsel out of this small support of the session. Uh, and I'm now happy to hand over to Neil, who will talk to you more about Sphere D. He is a compiler person who understands Dominic. <laughs> <laughs>